We're going to be looking at uh, Daniel chapter 11. We're going to be looking at uh, the king of the south and the king of the north. And one thing I like to bring out on this as we look at, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, please. Because the things in Daniel chapter 11 that we're going to discuss today are very important because it shows of where we're at in time. And your whole life is structured on what? Time. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. So we're talking about this time of the second coming, aren't we? Yeah. So the verses in Daniel chapter 11, just before this, are things that are to happen to show that where we're at just before the second coming. So not only is it a benefit to us, but this is also something that needs to be shared with our friends and families around us. Because we're told that Jesus says that when he, when he had shared the scriptures, that when things come to pass that you might believe. And when we look at at the Bible here, the reason why he shares these things is so that we could trust him, so that we know with what is happening, so that we have no fear. It'd be just like if, if uh, the little girl there was going to school and her mom told her what was going to happen all throughout the day. And that's what prophecy does. Jesus tells us what's going to happen. But when we think of, of this here, this war, I'm going to suggest that the king of the north, before we get into it and, and to show from scripture, that the king of the north is the papacy and the king of the south is Islam. And when we look at, we've got a chart here to the left. There was actually a war between the papacy and Islam in the past that was predicted in Revelation chapter 9. But we're going to share some things on these charts. Here we've got the war between uh, the Mohammedans or the Muslims. Something keeps kicking on here. Between the Muslims and the Romans, and we've also got between the Ottoman Turks and the Roman Catholics. But we're going to be looking at this third and last war. See this angel here at the bottom? We've also got it on the other chart here. We've got uh, the Mohammedans here, the Ottoman Turks, and we're going to be looking at this third and great war. And Habakkuk had a vision of this war. Joel had a vision of this war, John the Revelator did, and so did Daniel. So when we look at the prophets, they were all given visions of what's to happen. And as we, we read all of those prophets and bring the things together, we'll get the complete picture of, of what is happening. So we talked about the king of the north and the king of the south. I wanted to share a few scriptures here. As I got on the board here, I've got uh, two Babylons. Has anyone ever thought of two Babylons before? We're going to be looking at the first Babylon. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 4, please. Jeremiah chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 6. Set up, set up the standard toward Zion, retire. Stay not, for I will bring evil from where? the north, and great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of who? The Gentiles. So this power is coming from the north, and it's a destroyer of the Gentiles. And we want to take a look at who this is. Remember here it says it was a lion. Does anyone remember in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, it talked about that lion? Yeah. What did that lion represent? Babylon. Babylon. We're going to be talking about two Babylons today. One, the first Babylon, who was the king of that kingdom? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to be talking about Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, and we're also going to be talking about Babylon the Great. So there's two Babylons. This Babylon was represented during the time of Israel, back thousands of years ago, and we're also going to be discussing the Babylon of today which is the king of the north. But let's turn to Jeremiah 49, please. Concerning Kedar 
and concerning the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, shall smite, thus saith the Lord, Arise ye, go up to Kedar, and spoil the men of the east. So here it's talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. We've got a map here. Here's Babylon, right? And who was he to destroy? Kedar and the men of the east. Now we want to take a look at this map. We've got here the Kedar. I'm going to write this here. Kedar is found in this area right here in the Arabian Peninsula. So where is that in location to Babylon? South. So Babylon is moving south. So we're going to write on the board here, we're going to write that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, pushed south and it destroyed who? Kedar and who? The men of the east, right? Now I want to suggest something. This same history that happened in the past is going to come to fulfillment again under spiritual Babylon. And spiritual Babylon is who? We'll look later, but the, basically the Roman Catholic Church and the other Christians that hold to her views, right? So it's pushing to the south. We've got here the south. And we're going to see a reapplication of that through Revelation 17 and the things that are happening when we look at Habakkuk and Joel. We're going to find out that these same wars will happen again. But before we get into that, I want to share a little bit as to who, many of you know who Kedar and the, and the men of the east are, but I want to share some because there may be some of you that have not heard this. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 25, please. Genesis 25. We're going to look at verse 1 and 2. And I've written some of these names down here so we can help follow along through the, through the lecture. It says, Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan. See, I've got the word Midian here, because we're going to find that later. Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan begat who? Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashurium, Leshuam, and Lemuam. So this was from Abraham's third wife. And we've got three of those names up there, okay? Because we're going to find that later in the study. And now it talks about, we're going to go down to verse 5. It says, Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. What was Isaac to inherit? Over there in Jerusalem, the land of Canaan, right? And now look what the Bible says. It says, But unto the sons of the concubines, which would refer to Keturah and Hagar, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived where? Eastward to the east country. So just to the east of Jerusalem in the Jordanian River is where Ishmael, the Ishmaelites and the Midianites were to live. And does anyone know who Ishmael is? Do any of you kids know who Ishmael is? You know who Ishmael is? I heard a lot about them. Yeah. So here we've got some names. And let's look at verse 12. Verse 12. Because remember in here it said that they were to spoil the Kedar and the men of the east. They were to destroy them. And we find that in this verse here. This shares who this is. This is Ishmael's children. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sari's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to the generations. Nebaioth, Kedar, Abdeel, Mipsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tima, Jatur, Nafish, and Kadima. So I put a few of those names there. And we're going to show another little map here of the land that they were to inherit. Remember that we were told that the Ishmaelites were to go to the land of the east. 
But it also gives us a description here in verse 18, where they were to dwell. It says they were to dwell from where? Havla. Here's Havla right there. There's Havla. To Shur. This whole area here was to be the land of the, the Ishmaelites and the children of the east. Okay. We've shared a little bit on the, the children of the east. I want to take a look at uh, this king of the north. We want to get some description on who the king of the north is. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 11, please. Daniel chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 32. Now we're describing the, the mystery Babylon the Great, okay? We're going to put mystery. This isn't the first Babylon, this is the second Babylon, the Babylon of our time. Verse 32 says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame and captivity, and by spoil many days. What does that sound like to you? Does it sound like the time of the Dark Ages? Remember when there was millions of Christians being martyred? It says here that they shall fall by what? By flame, captivity, and spoil. It says, Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for an appointed time. Verse 36 is crucial. And the king shall do according to what? His will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. What did King Nebuchadnezzar do? Did he do that? King Nebuchadnezzar did, but now we're talking about another king. He does the same thing. And it's going to give us a description of this king and who he is. He shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of who? His fathers. Nor the desire of? Women. Who do you think this king is? He's an earthly king. He does not marry. Does not worship the God of his fathers. Oops. He is the Pope. Okay. We're going to find some more clues. Verse 38. But in his estate he shall honor the God of forces. A God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with what? Gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Did you know that the Roman Catholic Church is one of the richest groups of people on this earth today? And they're honoring the God of force with what? Their finance, their riches. But here it says the God of force. I'm going to write this down here. We're going to write a few more clues because we're going to we're going to look at this, this north. Not only is it the Pope and what they believe, but they believe in the Trinity. And they keep Sunday. But we're going to look for more, more clues within here to describe, because I want to show you a list. We're going to make a list of all the things that describe the king of the north and a list of all the things that describe the king of the south, and we're going to see if that meshes to get a true picture of Daniel chapter 11. Is everyone kind of following with what I'm saying? Okay, let's turn to Revelation 17, please. Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in what? Purple. What churches today have the, no the color of purple on them? Has anyone seen the, the, uh, the priests of the Roman church when they all get together and the cardinals, they got red and purple? Seen the pictures of them? 
Okay. It says, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her what? Forehead written what? Mystery, Babylon, the great. Remember I said there's two Babylons. We're describing the second Babylon, Mystery, Babylon, the great. And she's the mother of what? Harlots. So we could write harlots down here. And what do you think that mystery is in her forehead? What do people call the Trinity? Mystery. mystery. Her main doctrine is the Trinity. Mm -hmm. The other mystery found in the Bible is Christ Jesus and you, the hope of glory. Two exact opposites. Let's take a look at uh, verse 9. Verse 9 says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, which what? The woman said. So I'm going to write seven mountains. See all the clues that we're getting for this? How they're adding up? Let's continue on in verse uh, 18. And the woman which thou sawest is what? The great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So where does that woman sit? City with seven mountains. And where's that location? Rome. Rome. So we've got a complete description to help with who this king of the north is. And it's coming to destroy. Just like Nebuchadnezzar's time, it's going to come and destroy many others. Let's turn to, we've looked a little bit at the king of the north, but there's also, I forgot here, what's another important city found in Rome that represents this woman, this church? begins with a V. The Vatican. Let's, now we've looked at the king of the north. I want to show some thoughts on who the south is. Okay? Because remember that we're describing this last and great final war. And who's this war between? King of the north and king of the south. Let's turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse 1 says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write what? The vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Here is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Habakkuk chapter 2 that they were to write the visions upon tables. And why are they to write it upon these tables? So that he that readeth it may, may run. So he may run to help give other people understanding of what's coming and what's coming to pass, right? And then let's take a look at Habakkuk chapter 3. Because remember we're describing this last great and final war. Habakkuk has a description of this vision of the war. It says, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shiganoth. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. Verse 3 says, God came from where? Teman. Teman. I'm going to write that here. God came from Teman. Okay? And does anyone have a number next to Teman? I've got a number four. Does anyone have a number four there for a reference point? It says south. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're talking south. Teman is located right in this area right in here. Okay? It's south of Jerusalem. Who's coming from Teman? 
God. Now look at this. And the Holy One. Who's the Holy One? Who's the Holy One from Jerusalem? You got the Father and the Son. And where's he coming from? Mount where? Paran, parent. Here's Paran or parent. You see that there? It's between the, the peninsula there and moving into Arabia. It's that area. And where is that located? From Jerusalem. South. Okay. But I want to share another interesting point to that. So here we got the father and son coming from Paran and what was the other one? Teman from the south. Selah, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Verse 4, and his brightness was as a light. He had horns coming out of his hand. Who's been pierced in their hands? Jesus. And there was the hiding of his power. Before him went what? Pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and what? Measured the earth, and behold, he drove asunder the nations. What nations do you think Christ was driving asunder? If before we had the king of the north, Nebuchadnezzar, coming down and destroying the children of the east, now at the end of time we've got spiritual Babylon, the papacy, moving through the, less, through the rest of the land, destroying the children of the east again. So God is now trying to move away these other nations. It says in verse 7, I saw the tents of Kushan. So I'm going to write Kushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of what? Midian did tremble. So we've got uh, Kushan and Midian. Okay. Midian. Is this area right in here? Does anyone remember the story of Moses? He fled to the land of Midian in the Arabian desert. So here it's talking about a great war in the land of Midian, Kushan, and in the south. And just to give reference to this, people want to say, well, how do you know this is at the very end of time? This is what's going to happen. Take a look at verse 11. And the sun and moon, what? Stood still in their habitation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thy anointed. Thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. So here is talking about the very end of time. The sun and moon stand still. Jesus is coming forth to execute his father's judgment. And there's a great war in the land of the south. Let's take a look at Paran. Remember we looked at Paran on there? Let's turn to Genesis 21, 21, please. Remember, we're looking at Paran. Let's actually start with verse 17 so you get the, the index of what's happening. Verse 17 says, And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called unto Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. Arise, lift up thy lad, and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. So who was her son? Ishmael. Ishmael. But let's look at verse 21. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. At the very end of time, we've got the father and the son in the land of Tema and Paran. So it's referring to the Ishmaelites. And what is the majority of the people's faith today that refers to Ishmael's lineage? The Muslim people. The king of the north, the papacy, is coming to war against the people of the south, the children of the east, or the Muslims, at the very end of time. Let's take a look at another passage in... Uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 21, I've also got to write on here, Paran and Midian. Let 
Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 21. Isaiah 21, verse 1. The burden of the desert of the excuse me, the burden of the desert of the sea as whirlwinds wear. In the south. Remember, our whole focus has been on the south, right? South, south, south. So cometh from the desert from a terrible land a grievous vision. And it describes later in chapter 2, or 21, verse 2, who this is. It's the Medes and the Persians coming against Babylon, right? When you look at the map, the Medes were south of Babylon. So they moved north to execute. I'm going to suggest Isaiah chapter 21 has an application for past and for the times that we're in. Does that make sense? I'm not suggesting the war between Medio Persia and, and Babylon happens again. I'm saying that it's talking about another group of people from the south that inhabit this area and they're pushing towards Babylon again. Do you follow me? Because verse 9 says this. And, there, and behold, there cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. How many times is that? Twice. Did Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom fall twice? No. So I'm suggesting that not only did that refer to Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom in the first application, but the second application of Isaiah 21 refers to to the fall of Babylon the Great, the mystery. And I'm going to suggest why here. Because it says here, let's look at verse 11. What does verse 11 say? It says, the burden of Duma. Remember that name we had up here, Duma? Duma was a child of the east, one of Ishmael's lineage. It says, he calleth unto me, out of Seir, or Edom, watchmen, what of the night? Who were the watchmen today? Who was the watchman back during the time of Nebuchadnezzar's time? Was it the Babylonians? It was the Israelites. You were to be the Israelites of today, right? So you were the watchmen. So the people from Duma, Ishmael's lineage is asking you, what time of the night is it? And do we have the answers for it? We should, because we've got Habakkuk, Joel, Daniel. We've got all these things to where we could tell the Muslim people that the night's almost over. It says, The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night, if you will inquire, ye return and come. What does that return mean? Remember the time of, of Hagar and Sari? Hagar was to submit to Sari. The Muslims are today are to, to submit to the house of Israel of today. They are to come back. They are to return to the truce. Verse 13, the burden of Arabia. So we'll put down here, we're going to put Arabia, Duma, And Kedar. Verse 13 says, The burden upon Arabia. Okay, here we've got Arabia, right? Here's Arabia. In the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge. O ye traveling companies of who? Dedanium. The inhabitants of the land of Tema brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled. And what are they fleeing from in verse 15? Swords. So we've got the land of Tema up here, Dedanium. These are all Muslim people, children of the east. And they're living south of Jerusalem. But where, in verse, in verse, uh, 13, it says, where are they to lodge? Where are they to lodge? In the, forest. in the forest of Arabia. So they're being pushed back into the depths of Arabia. And we're going to show, we're going to show the map here that when, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom 
pushed, it pushed down. It never encompassed all of Arabia, did it? See how it only inhabited this area here? It never fully encompassed all of Arabia. Why would it not encompass all of Arabia? There's nothing there. It's sand. When you look at this area up here, why Babylon wanted this area strategically? Because when you look at the land of Arabia, it's now cut off. If, if, Rome, if Rome inhabitants all the area around the sea here, it cuts off the Arabian desert from getting anyone to transport any goods or food within it. There's no more trading. It's done with. It can't survive. And it says here in verse 16, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year according to the years of a hireling, and all of what? The glory of Kedar shall fail. So what does that mean if Kedar shall fail? It means the king of the north is coming in, destroying Kedar or the Muslim people. And the residue of the number of the archers, the mighty men of the children of Kedar, shall be diminished. For the Lord God of Israel has spoken. How many of you today hear people that are worried that the United States and Europe is going to become Islamic? The prophecies of Daniel chapter 11, Habakkuk, and all these things say no. It's the king of the north that prevails and destroys the king of the south. So let's turn back to uh, let's turn back to Daniel chapter eleven. Before we go there, I want to read. I want to read. I want to share something on the board here that I think is crucial. We've got the Father and the Son. Remember, the Son was the express image of the Father, right? So I'm going to write express. In the book of Revelation, chapter 7, we've got uh, Mystery Babylon the Great. She was called the mother of what? Harlots. Just like the Son was the express image of the Father and fulfilled His will, at the end of time, we've got the harlots, their express image of the Mother in doctrine, and they fulfill the Mother's will. Who are the harlots? Protestantism that's fallen that holds to its doctrine. So when we look at past history, the Mother... Babylon the Great destroyed God's true people. The harlots, apostate Protestantism, will do the same very thing today. So here we've got God's people, with Christ living in them, and they will be in the likeness of the image of the Father and the Son, and we've got the rest of the world that takes on the image of the first beast, And the second beast. We're only found in one or the other camp. And with what we see today, almost all Christians are yoking up under this within doctrine and their understanding. When we look at this here, Mystery Babylon the Great, and the, the king of the north, and we look at here at the king of the south. The king of the south believes in one God, does not believe in the Trinity. The war between us is over the issue of who God is. Today when you look in the news, the Muslims are killing Christians because they belong to this group. I want to suggest something today. When we look at the Reformation, last night was a perfect illustration of what's happening amongst God's people. What was the discussion on last night? Uh, are you clean and unclean meats? Came down, yes. An issue of pork. Now I'm going to suggest this to you. At one time, 
I used to drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, and all these things, but we're talking, I want to mention the word sanctification. What does sanctification mean? It means that God is making you clean and holy. He's changing you, and only He could do it, right? We can't change ourselves. But when we look at the study we had last night, there were people there that were open to God's working in their lives, right? And what did that lady decide last night? She's going to give up pork. The Lord is sanctifying her. Just like in your life, God has sanctified you. There are steps He's brought you through. You've accepted it, and He's changing you. So I'm going to write for today. We've got yesterday. Yesterday is past. Doesn't mean nothing. We want sanctification today. Right? There's things that God is going to show us in our lives that need to be changed further so that we come into the full, the full stature of who? Of Christ. I'm not there. I'm not in the full stature of Christ. But if I submit my heart and God is working and I submit today, I could be found righteous today by submitting to His will today, right? But ultimately, He wants to bring us into that full stature. When we look at this power here, the papacy and the pope, does it care about pork eating? Does it care about Sabbath? Does it care about sanctification? It actually speaks against it. When we look at the war between Muslims and Christians today, when we look at past history, Muslims came to war against Christians that did not believe in sanctification and being changed. They protected the true Christians, the true Christians that were being sanctified and changed. For instance, when we look at the Baptists, the Methodists, the Lutherans, they all had specific truths, right? They were going through the sanctification process. God accepted those people where they're at, but where we're at today is far different down the line. We need to be coming in here to a closer, full stature of Christ and what the people were back there. Does that make sense? So when you look at today, when you see Muslims killing Christians, they're killing Christians that eat pork, Christians that keep and believe in the Sunday, Christians that believe in the Trinity, Christians that are submitting to Rome. I want to share some things here. We're going to go through a few more things here. Let's take a look at uh, Revelation 9. I'm only going to touch this a little bit to give you an idea there of what what past history was there. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 9. Revelation 9 verse 3 says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. I want to share a little bit with you. We're looking at the time period here where the Roman Catholic Church is in power for the three and a half years of the 1260 time period. The Roman Church is killing any Christians that doesn't believe in its doctrine. What was the main doctrine of the Roman Church that it killed people over? Three and one, one and three, the Trinity. And it uprooted the three horns or the three toes. Remember that? You had the, the hairy lie, the ostrogoths, I can't remember the vandals. the vandals. And the ostrogoths were uprooted in 538. They were destroyed and murdered because they would not submit to the belief of the Trinity. So that's the time period we're talking here. 9 verse 3 says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And we're going to look at the locusts. The locus of the Bible is the Muslims. And let's turn to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And we're going to write that on the board too. We'll write that under up here in the south. We've got Judges 6 and Revelation 9. 
Judges 6, verse uh, 1 says, And the children of, the, of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them to the hand of Midian seven years. Remember, we got Midian here, one of the children of the east. And the Midianites and the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains, the caves, and the strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. So the children of the east and the Midianites are coming up against Israel. And you see that going on in Israel today. You see the Muslim people coming to war against Israel. They're throwing bombs back and forth, missiles. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came up as grasshoppers or locusts for multitudes. So here the children of the east are called locusts. In Bible prophecy, the Muslims are the locusts. And we'll go back to Revelation 9. Revelation 9 says why these locusts are coming up. Why these Muslims are coming up. Verse 4. It was commanded them, the locusts or the Muslims, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. But who were they to hurt? Only those men which have what? Not the seal of God in their foreheads. If you were a Christian today and you believed in the Trinity, could you receive the seal of God? If you were a Christian today and you bowed to idols, could you receive the seal of God? If you were a Christian today and you did not keep the Sabbath, could you receive the seal of God? So they were to hurt the people that had not the seal of God in their foreheads. They were to hurt this group of people. And let's take a look at what the Bible says about this group of people, what they were doing. Verse 20. This was the Muslim, Ottoman Turks, that they were to hurt those of the Roman Catholic persuasion. Verse 20 says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, these plagues of the locust, yet repented not of the works of their hands. What do you think the works of their hands are? could be many things. Remember we talked about last night about making our own garments of righteousness? It could be works of their hands when they actually carved out idols of stone and placed in their churches which people would bow and kiss. It could be many things. But it says here that they should not worship what? Devils. Of idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So the Ottoman Turkish Muslims were coming to war against those of the Roman Catholic faith for their idolatry. God commanded them to. So when we look at Daniel chapter 11, the king of the south is coming to war against Mystery Babylon the Great. And we'll take a look at a map here to, to show that again. Because we're going we're gonna to look through the rest of Daniel chapter 11 here. Daniel chapter 11. Am I going too fast? Okay. Daniel chapter 11. We're going to finish up here looking at Daniel 11. It says, remember we talked about the king of the north. Verse 40, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now I'm going to suggest to you, like we went through this list, the king of the south is who? All these names, what do they represent? Islam. Every one of them represents Islam. And the king of the north were suggestions to papacy. The Roman Catholic persuasion, because when we look on the map here, remember here where Rome's first uh, seat of authority was in Italy, Rome, and then it moved its seat to uh, Constantinople after Constantine in 331. Why did it move from here to there? 
Remember the wars over here, the ten divisions or the ten toes and the wars that happened? It moved its authority over there to be protected. So it moves its authority to here. At the very end of time, we're going to read through Daniel chapter 11, it wants to move its authority again, but it wants to move it to where? Jerusalem, the Holy Land. Because where is Jesus coming back from? When he comes, where is, where is, where, when the new Jerusalem comes down, where is it going to be planted? Right there. There's another king that wants worship to be like Christ. Who is that? He's the vicar of Christ here on earth. He's the one that's coming to our Congress this year in September. He's the Pope. He wants the worship. He wants a seat in authority. He wants all to look to him. I'm not saying this very particular Pope, but the Pope in general. I can't say that this specific Pope is going to do this, but it very well could be. So let's read on here. It says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into what? The countries and shall overflow and pass over. So the king of the north is going to enter into other countries. It's going to move, right? It says here, He, he shall enter the glorious land, which is the area of the land of Canaan or Jerusalem. And many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Who's the he in the next verse? He, the king of the north. Who's the king of the north? Who stands at its head? The pope. He shall have power over what? The treasures of the gold and silver and over all precious things. What do we teach at the end of time? That you can't buy it, that those that have the mark, of, those that do not take the mark of the beast can't what? Buy or sell. This is saying here the king of the north, the papacy, has control over the finance. Do you see that? He has complete control of the finance of these countries. And it says who these countries are of Egypt, Libya, and the Ethiopians. Now I'm going to ask you a question Libya, Egypt. Ethiopians. Do we see the king of the north right now within full power in those countries? We do not. What power do we see that's involved in these countries right now? Islam. Islam is now striking. Have you heard on the news that it wants to apparently strike the Vatican? If you were to look from the biblical, or not the biblical, but a, a map of the world, and we're looking at these people here, and we've got the king of the north here, and they're marching, wouldn't it appear that the king of the south is coming and attacking the king of the north? It's wanting to push into Europe, and all of the Europeans are getting scared. They're saying, Islam's coming, they're going to overrun us. So here it says that he shall... He, the king of the north, the pope, the papacy, shall have power over the treasures of the gold and silver over these countries. I'm suggesting we are moving into fulfillment of these verses. They have not been fulfilled. There's people teaching they've been fulfilled. They've not been fulfilled. We're in the process. This prophecy has not been completely fulfilled. We're moving into it. But what does that say? Because remember in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it said that that was happening just before the second coming of Christ. So we're seeing the very end movements of time before Jesus comes back. I want to share a, a thought here. We're going to take a look at the book of Joel. We're going to wrap up in the book of Joel. Joel had an understanding of this last great war. Joel chapter 1, I'll read a few verses in 1, we're going to move to chapter 2, because I believe Joel had a description. Remember when I talked about Revelation chapter 9, of the war between the, the Ottoman Turks and the Roman Catholics? In Revelation chapter 9, it talked about four messengers from the Euphrates rivers. These four messengers were the four caliphs. 
okay? They were given command to go and execute judgment against those of the Roman Catholic faith. Joel, I believe, has given a description of this too. Joel chapter 1 verse 3 says, Tell ye your children of it, let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left. Now, these words here, we got palmer worm, canker worm, caterpillar, and locust. They all mean basically the same thing, locust. And what do we say the locusts were? The children of the East or the Muslims. It says, That which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Verse 6, for what? A nation. Now, Joel's given a description of locusts, but these locusts are called a nation. You see that in verse 4, or excuse me, verse 6, a nation. The nation, the four caliphs or the four nations, were given power to execute judgment upon the Roman Catholic Church. Now we're going to move to Joel chapter 2. Because Joel chapter 2 talks about these locusts. And in Joel chapter 2, in verse 11, verse 10, it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and moon shall be dark, and stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall what? Utter his voice before his army. And this is army of locusts. So it's talking about this is God's army. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide in it? In verse 6, it says, Before the faces of the people shall be much pained, and all faces shall gather what? Blackness. So I believe that God's given us a description when we talked about this last and great war that Joel's seen it. The locusts, the Muslims, people are coming to execute judgment. And who do you think they're going to execute judgment on today? If we look at past history, what do you think they'll do today? The very same thing, won't they? Won't the papacy do the very same thing that it did? So the Muslims will come to war against Christians that are not being sanctified, that are not being changed, that are following the ways of the Pope. And I've got one quote we'll read here. This comes from uh, William Miller. William Miller was an old Baptist preacher, and he talks about Joel's chapter 1 and 2. This is referring to Revelation 9, the third verse. William Miller says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. By these locusts I understand armies. I'm going to stop the quote. Do you see armies building up today in the Middle East? And everyone's scared of them, aren't they? See, Joel's first and second chapters. Therefore I should read this text thus, And there came out of these Mohammedan followers large armies, which should have great power to execute the judgments of God on this anti-Christian beast. Who is the anti-Christian beast? The Roman Catholic Church. Which had filled the earth with her abominations. Didn't we talk about the Trinity this morning? That many people, even within our own people, have a false understanding of who God is? Fourth verse. And it was commanding them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. By grass, green things, and trees, Psalm 72, 16, Hosea 14, 8, I understand the true church or people of God. By those men having not the seal of God, etc., I understand the anti-Christian church or papal Rome. Then it would be thus since, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the true church or people of God, but only the anti-Christian beast or power subject to her. And I want to mention something today. It says the anti-Christian beast, which is papal Rome, or power subject to her. Would it appear to Muslims today that we are in subjection to people of the Roman Catholic faith and the Pope. We've got the Pope coming here. 
we send people, many of our people visit the Vatican. We're enthralled with Christianity with the Vatican. Or power subject to, or what about Muslims killing other Muslims? Could it be that, that when we look at Islam, the killing side, the reason why it's killing other Muslims, it's killing other Muslims because they've got people within their government that are subjecting to the United States and Europe and wanting to associate and the Muslims are saying, no, this is wrong, so we're going to war against even our own people that are being in subjection to the king of the north. I encourage you to look and study all this through, but I think from my reading it's pretty clear who the king of the south and the king of the north is, that we're moving into that time. And this, these are things that we could share with people to bring them to Christ. Because when you think of the first times that you understood prophecy, what did it do to your life? All of a sudden, you trusted this Bible. And you still have that trust today, don't you? Most of Christianity today does not trust this word. They talk about Jesus. But like even in other studies and other people I know, they say, well, that part of the Bible is not for me. I can't understand that part. That part's not for us. All we need to do is believe. Do they have true belief? Jesus didn't live that life. If anyone had a reason to live a life like that, of all people, Jesus would have. And he didn't. He lived by the word of God. And may the Lord be with you and... and uh, May the Lord use you to bring many to Christ.